What's up guys, Kudokun here, and today we're going to finally get around to talking about the Lightseekers TCG. For those who don't know, Lightseekers TCG is actually not just a card game, it's also a multimedia franchise. So in addition to the card game, we've also got things like figures, and a free-to-play app game to tie it all together. But today what we care about is the card game, so let's learn how to play and see if maybe they're trying to do a little bit too much. To start building your Lightseekers TCG deck, you'll want to pick one hero of one of six colors. Each hero will have three symbols here in the middle of the card denoting which cards they're allowed to use. In addition to elements, every card in the Lightseekers TCG will fall into one of three categories. The categories are different for the six elements, so you'll just want to keep an eye on it. You'll also notice that one or two of the symbols will be in a glowing golden ring like this. Don't worry too much about what that means right now, but just keep in mind that if you're using cards of a very specific symbol, you'll want to use a hero that has that symbol in a glowing ring. Down here on the bottom right will also be that hero's life. Every hero starts out with a different life counter, so this could also come into consideration when you're choosing which hero to use. Most heroes will also come with some kind of ability listed here in the card text. Usually, having a good ability is balanced out by having less life or having less special symbols. The special symbols are called superior symbols, by the way, and I'll be calling them that way from now on. Rather than summoning characters or creatures like other games, you'll mainly be using attack cards to deal damage to your opponent and then discarding them. There are no traditional costs in the Lightseekers TCG, but instead there will just be a symbol at the top denoting which exact symbol this card falls under. This specific symbol means gravity, so it's an astral card with the symbol of gravity. We'll learn more about what all that means later, but for right now, the main thing we need to keep in mind is there are no costs to pay on most of the cards in the Lightseekers TCG. The effect of the card will be listed here in the card text. Once you've applied its effect, it will be discarded. And finally, the card's type will be listed at the bottom. An attack card means that it affects your opponent. This is normally in the form of damage, but sometimes attack cards can mess with your opponent's field, hand, or deck. Next up, let's take a look at defend cards. Now, your gamer instincts would tell you that defend cards are cards that you can use during your opponent's turn, but that is in fact not the case. Functionally, there's no difference between using an attack card or a defend card. The difference is the defend cards will not normally affect your opponent, but normally do something to help you. There are also cards with special effects that affect either attack cards or defend cards, but for the most part, they're all played during your turn. Buffs are the most unique cards in the game, and likely the ones you'll be paying the most attention to. The symbol in the top left part of the card will tell you whether or not the card is clunky or regular. The circle symbol we see here means that the card is regular. At the beginning of each of your turns, regular buffs will turn 90 degrees counterclockwise. If you ever forget which direction that is, the yellow arrow at the top of the circle will remind you. Once the card has been turned, the number in the top left will change. In this case, the card's effect will now refer to the number 3. The card will continue to turn like this every turn until it gets back to its original position. Once the card has hit either a blank corner or its original position, whichever one comes first, the card is discarded. This will be a little difficult to get used to at first, but trust me, it is the most complicated thing about the game, so if you remember to do this, you're completely solid the rest of the match. Buffs with an angular symbol instead of a perfect circle are called clunky. Clunky buffs will never turn on their own. Instead, you have to use the ability listed on the card in order to activate the buff and make it turn. In the case of Spectral Guide, we can choose to activate its ability to draw the number of cards listed in the top left, which is 2. Deciding to use this effect will cause the card to turn to its next corner. Next turn, we can choose to use the effect again. Doing this will shift the card to a corner where there is no visible number. That means that this card's effect is now over and must be discarded. The last card type we'll look at are items. Items will have a symbol here in the middle. This means that your character now has access to this specific symbol. This is hypothetically how you would make a multicolored deck work. Once you have a card like this attached to your hero, it can now use this symbol regardless of what symbols it normally has access to. The number in the bottom left represents how many item spaces the item is worth. Characters can only use two item spaces worth of items, so either two one-cost items or one two-cost item. If at any point a character has more than that, you must immediately discard item cards until you are at two or less. Finally, there's one last thing we have to talk about, and that's combos. Combo cards are the most powerful cards in your deck, but do for the most part act like other cards. 
Every deck will have exactly 5 combo cards with no duplicates. One immediately noticeable difference is that this card has 3 symbols instead of 1. In order to play this card from our hand, we have to send 2 beast cards and 1 nature card from our hand back into the deck and then shuffle. One neat trick is we can use combos to pay for combos, so if we were to get rid of Ambush from our hand for example, it would satisfy one beast and one forest, meaning we would only need one more beast to pay for it. Once the payment has been met, we can finally use the effect just like a regular attack card. Keep in mind that combos will also come in the form of buff cards or defend cards in some cases. Now that we know more about the game, let's talk about how to actually play. Start by putting your hero here on the hero space. Our hero's starting life is 31. You would normally take a token and put it on the board where the life counter is, but I would highly recommend using something like dice or a pencil and paper. Since this is a digital tutorial, I can just put a number on the screen, like that. Shuffle your deck and put it here in the deck slot. Now you'll want to decide who's going first. The player who goes first starts with 4 cards in their hand, while the player who goes second starts with 5. If you're playing with more than two people, then the player who goes third starts with six, and any player who goes fourth, fifth, or above starts with seven. We'll assume you're going first. Start with four cards from the top of your deck. There are no mulligans here, so I certainly hope you like your opening hands. If you're wondering whether or not the player who goes first draws a card at the beginning of their turn, I can actually solve that for you by telling you that no player will draw a card at the beginning of their turn. Yes, unlike most card games, there is no draw phase at the beginning of the turn. It in fact takes place at the end of the turn, so we'll get onto it later. The first thing we would normally do is apply the effects of and rotate buffs that are on the field, but since we're going first, there's no buffs on the field to affect. During your turn, you're allowed to take up to two actions. This can include either playing a card from your hands or activating a card that's already on the field. For example, our hero has an effect that allows us to take two damage and then draw two cards from our deck. If we choose to do this, we can't use it again during the turn because each card can only be played or activated one time. This would also take up one of our actions for the turn. Following in line with this, you'll notice that most buffs have an X in the top left corner the first time you play them. The X means there is no number assigned to your card's effect, so in most cases this means that your buff does not have an effect until it is turned for the first time. Hypothetically, if we were to play a card like this that does have an effect that we could use, we couldn't use it the turn that we played it. This is because actually playing a card on the field counts as activating it, and a card cannot be activated more than once per turn. So next turn we could activate it by using its effect. Here's where we finally get to talk about superior symbols. Normally during your turn, you can only play a card of a specific symbol one time. Since Flame Bat has a fire symbol, after we play this, we can't play any more fire symbols for the rest of the turn. So we can't play a Flame Bat and then play like a Flame Chained Warrior because it has the same symbol. But if our hero has that symbol as one of their Golden Ring special symbols, it means they have superior for that element and that rule no longer applies to them. This hero, for example, can activate two fire cards in a turn, or two earth cards in a turn. As you can probably imagine, combo cards are special. Because their effect is normally so powerful, once we activate it, we cannot activate any more cards for the rest of our turn. Since a combo takes up our entire turn, you also can't use a combo card if you've already activated a card during your turn. So if you do decide to use a combo, it is the only thing you get to do during your turn. Once you've chosen to activate two cards, either by playing cards from your hand or activating cards on the field, your turn is over. At the end of your turn is your draw phase. The draw phase in the Lightseekers TCG is actually pretty unique and is a part of the Lightseeker strategy. During your draw phase, you get to draw one card for each card you did not activate during your turn. So if you chose to activate zero cards during your turn, then you get to draw two cards. If you activated one card, you get to draw one card, and if you used both of your activations, you don't get to draw at all. If you used a combo during your turn, then you get to draw one card at the end of your turn no matter what. Regardless of how powerful a combo is, it still only counts as activating one card. So learning when to conserve how many actions you play during your turn, and when to just draw a bunch of cards from your deck at the end of your turn is going to be an important factor in how you play the game. Just as a side note, there is no maximum hand size in this game, so hoard as many cards as you wish. Now that we've gone over everything, let's skip forward a bit and go over a turn to make sure you've got it. There is no draw phase at the beginning of our turn, so we do not draw a card. 
We start our turn instead by activating buffs on the field from left to right. First, rotate all in-play non-permanent buffs by 90 degrees counterclockwise. We now start applying their effects starting at the left. Since 2 is in the corner of Magma Worm, we will deal 2 damage to our opponent. Since our Ancient Miner is on a side with no active corner, we will ignore its effect this turn. Enriched Soil will heal us for the 3 in the top left corner. And now Everrock Racer will move 3 attack cards from our opponent's hands to their deck. If your enemy claims to not have 3 attack cards, you may look over their hand to make sure. Now we need to clean up any inactive buffs. Inactive buffs are buffs that are on a corner that does not have a number or a symbol, or buffs that have been turned all the way around until they're in their upright position. Ancient Miner has expired and will disappear from the field. The other buffs should move over to fill the empty space. Now our turn can begin proper. We have two actions to work with, and for every action we don't take, we'll get to draw one card at the end of our turn. We decide to activate Flame Chain Warrior to deal 4 damage to our opponent and rotate one of their buffs. As our second action, we decide to use our hero's ability to take 2 damage and draw 2 cards. Luckily we gained 3 life earlier, so taking that 2 damage is not a big deal. Now that we have taken 2 actions, our turn is over, and we cannot draw any cards from our deck because we chose to take both of our actions instead of drawing. One last thing I'd like to talk about is what happens when you run out of cards in your deck. Well, you don't outright lose, but you will take a pretty severe penalty. Anytime you would normally draw a card from your deck, or you're forced to draw a card from your deck, you instead have to discard one card from your hand or your field. This can be any in-play buff or item. If you're in a position where you can't draw, discard a card from your hand, or discard a card from your field, then you are declared the loser. And honestly, that's about it. There are some more advanced rulings and such I could get into, but as far as the basics go, that's everything you need to know. So what do I think of the Lightseekers TCG? Um, I'll be honest here, I'm really impressed with how well this game came out. I know the game's been out for a little while already, but it's picking up traction and I can definitely see why. It's been so long since we've gotten a fresh original AAA card game that isn't copying something else and actually came out fun and unique. I'm not so sure about this multimedia thing, I don't really know enough about it to know if the figures are good or the app is good or even the world is good really, but I can tell them one thing, they made a fun original TCG and I commend them for that. If I could nitpick the game a little bit, I'd say that there's a little bit of a disconnect between the actual artwork and the game itself. When you watch the gameplay videos, they stress that this is meant to be a strategic, serious, competitive card game that is not meant for casuals, okay? It's meant to actually sit down and master it and get really good at it. The art style, however, suggests that the game is meant for a much younger audience than how they actually portray it, so... It's a bit of a toss-up. This is getting really nitpicky here. Uh, I think that the art style clashes a bit with what they actually intended the game to be, but I can see anybody getting into this game regardless of whether they're a casual or they want a serious challenge. So I can't really hold this point against them. It's just that there's so little else to complain about in the card game, this is the one thing that sort of stuck out to me. If you're looking to try out something that's fresh, new, exciting, and fun, then I have no problems at all suggesting the Lightseekers TCG. Hey you, thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate it if you left me a like. They help the channel grow and let me know that you want more of this kind of content in the future. The channel is currently being supported by these lovely folks on Patreon. You guys rock! If you have any thoughts on the video, of course leave them in the comment section below along with suggestions on what I should do next but also answer this question to prove that you made it to the end of the video, if you feel like it. And finally, if you found this video by accident, then subscribe to stay up to date on the latest Kudo news. You can also hit the notification bell. Ringing the little bell will let you know when I upload a new video. See you next time!